Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Simon Reed Henry, and I'm the director of the Institute of Humanities and Social Sciences here at Queen Mary University of London. And we're delighted uh, to be hosting Jeff Sebo today to discuss his recently published and wonderful book, Saving Animals, Saving Ourselves, Why Animals Matter for Pandemics, Climate Change and Other Catastrophes. Jeff is Clinical Associate Professor of Environmental Studies, Affiliated Professor of Bioethics, Medical Ethics and Philosophy, and Director of the Animal Studies MA program at NYU. His previous writings include the co-author Chimpanzee Rights and Food Animals and the Environment, both published by Routledge in 2018. Jeff's an Executive Committee member at the NYU Center for Environmental and Animal Protection, an Advisory Board member of the Animals in Context series at NYU Press, a board member at Minding Animals International, a mentor at Sentient Media and a senior research affiliate at the Legal Priorities Project. But perhaps more importantly, even than each of these transdisciplinary affiliations and his many achievements, Jeff is a truly original thinker who's foraging on topics from cultured meat to the moral problem of other minds, spans the world of policy debate as well as academia, where he's committed to animal studies and animal protection. One of Jeff's distinctive and primary claims, certainly as I read his work, is the idea encompassed really by this book that animal welfare and care for the non-human matters constitutively also for human sustainable development. And that certainly does come out in this book, Saving Animals, where Jeff argues that humans have a moral responsibility to include animals in global health and environmental policy, amongst other things. In particular, Jeff suggests we should reduce our use of animals as part of our pandemic and climate change mitigation efforts and increase our support for animals as part of our adaptation efforts. In other words, that we learn to consider human and non-human needs more holistically. Jeff also examines connections between animal welfare and such practical issues as, as education, employment, social services and infrastructure, as well as with theoretical understandings of well-being, moral status, political status and, and population ethics. And in all cases across this diverse range of topics, Jeff shows in the book that these issues are both important and complex, but that we should neither underestimate our responsibilities because of our limitations, nor underestimate our limitations because of our responsibilities. Jeff, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the IHSS to discuss what I think will prove a really important work in the current context and going forwards. And in a few moments, I'll be asking Jeff just to spend 15 minutes or so outlining the book and some of the major take homes within it. And then I'm delighted to say that we'll also be hearing from three panelists about their take on, on your work. Our first panelist is Dr. Raphael Fassel, first of all, an affiliated lecturer at the Faculty of Law of the University of Cambridge and a teaching by fellow and director of studies in law at Jesus College Cambridge. Raphael was previously a research fellow at LSE in the law school where he obtained his PhD, after, sorry, he obtained his PhD in law from the University of Cambridge with a thesis on the legal theory and intellectual history of human and animal rights for which he was awarded the university's York Prize. Next, we'll be hearing from Dr. Beth Greenhow, an Associate Professor of Human Geography and Fellow of Keeble College, University of Oxford and former uh, colleague of ours here at the Department of Geography in Queen Mary. And Beth's research is concerned with the ways in which humans, animals and microbes become resources for biomedical research. She's currently co-PI on the Wellcome Trust Animal Research Nexus Project and co-author of a number of works of bioinformation, which was published with Polity Press in 2017, Health Geography is a Critical Introduction with Wiley Blackwell, also in 2017, and before that, Bodies Across Borders, uh, published by Routledge in 2015. And then finally, we have, and we'll be hearing from Dr. John Adinatiri, who's one of our own lecturers in law here at Queen Mary University of London, and a core part of the growing intellectual college here at the IHSS. John's research has focused on the legal right to exemption for religious and non-religious conscientious objectors from a wide variety of legal obligations, including anti-discrimination norms. And he currently works on the genealogy of religion and religious freedom and on non-human animals and constitutional law and theory, some of which we've already been hearing about in our lecture series here at the IHSS. So with these speakers introduced, and thank you to all of you for your time and for joining us today, I think we're going to have a really wonderful conversation the format for today will be as follows. We'll ask Jeff now to spend 15 minutes or so outlining the book, 
Then we'll go to our panelists, Raphael, Beth, and John, who will speak in that order for around about 10 minutes each. And then I'll bring you all into conversation uh, and we can pick up on some of these comments after which it will be open to you in the audience to raise any questions that you have for any of our speakers today. And you can do that via the chat function, which Yolanta will have, will have put up shortly. We aim to be finished just before 4.30 UK time. Um, I recognize there are people here joining us from other, other time zones, but uh, looking forward to the conversation. And uh, Jeff, with that, uh, over to you. And uh, thank you for coming and introducing your book to us. Okay, well, thank you, first of all, so much, everybody, for organizing this event and participating in it and attending it. It really means a lot that so many distinguished people would engage with my work, and I am really looking forward to the conversation. So again, thanks to, to each of you. And uh, yeah, so my goal here is to give a broad introduction to the book, and I want to try to do that pretty fast because I think that the discussion will be really interesting, and I want to leave as much time for that as possible. So as Simon said, my book is called Saving Animals, Saving Ourselves, and is about how animals relate to global health and environmental issues like pandemics and climate change. And what I argue in the book is that animals are central to these global health and environmental threats, both as causes through no faults of their own and as victims. And in particular, that our use of animals, our exploitation and extermination of animals in industries like factory farming and deforestation and the wildlife trade are leading contributors to threats like pandemics and climate change, and threats like pandemics and climate change are in turn leading contributors to biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and human and non-human suffering and death. And so what that means is that if we take animals seriously, then we need to include animals in our pandemic and climate change mitigation efforts by reducing our use of them, our exploitation and extermination of them as part of our mitigation efforts, and include them in our adaptation efforts by increasing our support for them as part of our adaptation efforts. So as we try to reduce the risk of future pandemics, reduce the severity of climate change, we need to phase down and eventually phase out industries like factory farming, deforestation, and the wildlife trade, and phase up, replace them with humane, healthful, and sustainable plant-based alternatives, including plant-based and possibly cultivated meat as alternatives to conventional meat. And as we try to build the, the resilient and sustainable cities and food and energy and transportation systems of the future, we need to consider human and non-human interests and needs and rights holistically in an integrated way so that we can build new structures that are accommodating for all of the sentient beings, all of the human and non-human animals who might occupy them. And that way we can reduce the, the types of conflicts that humans and non-humans might experience in the future rather than simply resolve them, which we should also do equitably. Okay, so those are some of the main goals of the book. The way that I proceed is, first of all, arguing that no matter what our moral values are, we have reason to care about how animals relate to these issues. Uh, some people in, in ethics care about welfare, other people care about rights. So a longstanding debate is that some people think that we should be in the business of promoting happiness and reducing suffering. Other people think that we should be in the business of leaving others alone and respecting their rights. And one of my main points is that in the Anthropocene, in a world reshaped by human activity and human caused climate change, these different ethical frameworks converge on a shared set of ideas about how we ought to relate to other animals. Because on one hand, the idea that we should promote happiness and reduce suffering in the world, that framework says we need to care about animals because they can be happy and they can suffer and their happiness and suffering matters and we have the power to improve their lives, improve their well-being. But we should also be mindful that the world is really complicated and nature is really complicated and our attempts to intervene in the lives of other animals and improve their well-being can often go wrong. So we do have responsibilities to other animals to, to improve their well-being, but we also have a responsibility to acknowledge our limitations, the limitations on our knowledge and power and motivation, and to try to improve the well-being of other animals 
in ways that are humble and cautious and uh, tractable. Okay, and then on the other side, rights theorists, people who think that our primary responsibility is to leave others alone and respect their rights, they would ordinarily say that we should probably not intervene in the lives of animals because that, that would interfere with their agency and autonomy uh, and, and would be morally wrong for that reason. But they need to acknowledge that, again, we now live in the Anthropocene, this, this epoch defined by the impacts of human activity on the planet. And so we already are, whether we like it or not, interfering with the lives of other animals in various ways that undermine their agency and autonomy. And, and so now trying to help, trying to save uh, other animals is not a matter of interfering with their lives where we might otherwise have not done that, but is instead an attempt to reduce and repair the harm that we are already causing them. So what we see in the Anthropocene is that these different ethical frameworks converge on this idea that we should humbly but cautiously take responsibility for the, the lives and the well-being of other animals and attempt to help them in ways that can be uh, effective and ethical and tractable. Uh, and, and so that is the goal that I set out in, in the book and what I hope can be a basis for uh, consensus, even among people who have different beliefs and values about ethics and policy. And from there, I argue that even though it would be demanding to attempt to phase down factory farming and deforestation and the wildlife trade and phase up plant-based alternatives, and even though it would be demanding to include animals, including domesticated and wild animals, in our advocacy and policy and, and consider their welfare when we make policy decisions. It is not too demanding to do, and we are able to do it. We are able to find co-beneficial ways to improve human and non-human lives at the same time, as long as we think holistically and structurally and comprehensively. There are things that we can do to help us and to help them. Uh, and, and even when we might find it a little bit demanding to make the world a safer place for animals. We should do it anyway, because we owe them that much. I then, uh, later in the book, consider some actual policy areas and policy proposals that I think can make a positive difference in the short term. For example, we can do more research and advocacy for animals so that we understand them more and understand how to help them more, and so that we have more political will for helping them. We can also include animals in the impact assessments that inform policy decisions and create offices and governments, uh, animal welfare offices and positions so that some people are empowered to represent animals in conversations that affect them. We can include animals in, in policy decisions then about all kinds of different issues. For example, employment and education. When we train people for the jobs of the future, we can train them to, to support animals rather than harm them. And we can teach them about why animals matter and how animals relate to global health and the environment. And then when we create jobs programs for the future, we can create new green jobs where people are taking care of the environment and taking care of animals, creating jobs so that people who currently depend on factory farming or deforestation or the wildlife trade for uh, food or for income, they have other jobs that they can move to instead. Uh, and similarly, social services and infrastructure policy. We can create more resources so that we can take care of animals through, for example, veterinary services. And that will be good for us and for them, because the more that we can reduce the spread of diseases among animals, the more we can also reduce the spread of diseases to humans, for example. And if we make the right kinds of infrastructure changes, then again, we can create new environments, new structures that reduce the types of conflicts that humans and non-humans are currently experiencing. For example, we can uh, require that new buildings have bird-friendly glass to reduce collisions with birds, or that new vehicles or transportation systems have bird-friendly glass. We can require that new transportation systems have overpasses or underpasses or wildlife corridors to reduce collisions that harm human and non-human animals. We can create new uh, green spaces in, in urban parks and urban environments where animals can be safe and protected and live well. 
uh, in these sorts of ways, we can build new multi-species communities that can be accommodating for human and non-human animals at the same time. But I also note, and this is where the book gets complicated in the final few chapters, that in addition to plucking these low-hanging fruit opportunities to improve the lives of human and non-human animals at the same time, we also have to ask deeper and harder questions so that we can know where to go in the long run. And those include questions about, for example, the legal and political status of animals. Right now, animals have the legal and political status of objects, property, or commodities in most legal and political systems. Should we consider, instead, giving animals the legal status of person or subject, the types of beings who can have legal rights and, and uh, uh, legal recourse in, in our systems? Should we extend them the status of citizens, or in other words, members of our political community so that they can have certain appropriate membership rights within our political communities? And in turn, how should we think about basic political concepts and ideals like capitalism and liberalism and democracy in a world that takes animals seriously? What would capitalism look like if animals could own property rather than be owned as property? What would liberalism look like if the right to liberty of animals could be respected too? What would democracy look like if the voices or at least interests and preferences of animals were required to be considered as part of the democratic process? And that in turn raises a bunch of really difficult scientific and philosophical questions that we also have to answer if we take animals seriously as part of our advocacy and policy. For example, when we make public health policy, part of what we do are consider the, the interests and needs and rights of all stakeholders at the same time. We do cost benefit analyses that say, how will everything, everyone be impacted and which policy is best for the population? Uh, both by improving their welfare and by respecting their rights. And if we include animals in that, that requires us to make interspecies comparisons. How is this going to affect humans? How is this going to affect elephants? How is this going to affect giraffes? How is it going to affect ants? Uh, and, and that requires us to ask, uh, are they conscious? How much happiness and suffering can they experience? When are they living well and when are they living badly? Those are some of the hardest questions of science and philosophy and they're dangerous questions for us to ask and answer as humans with our human biases and ignorance. So how can we do that well? Similarly, one of the challenges about climate change especially is that it not only impacts humans and non-humans at present, but also humans and non-humans in the future. One of the major things that climate change is going to do is uh, contract some populations and expand other populations. Some animals are going to do worse and other animals are going to do better. So how can we thoughtfully account not only for the present impacts of human activity, but also for the expected future impacts of human activity? My view is that in order to do this well, we cannot only do the things that I recommend as a starting point, include bird-friendly glass on buildings and wildlife corridors on transportation systems and plant-based food systems, though we should do that too. We also need to take animals seriously as individuals and thoughtfully consider our impacts on all current and future animals, and that will require a lot of work to do well. So the main message of this book is that we have a responsibility to include animals in global health and environmental advocacy and policy, both by reducing our use of them as part of our pandemic and climate change mitigation efforts, and by increasing our support for them as part of our pandemic and climate change adaptation efforts, but that we also have serious limits on our ability to do that ethically and effectively at present, owing to the limitations on our knowledge and our power and our political will. And as Simon said in his introduction, I think that means that we need to, as a starting point, take our responsibilities and our limitations seriously in equal measure. We need to treat this issue as both urgent and complex. It can be tempting to think we have responsibilities to other animals. And so to discount our limitations, to just go full steam ahead with all sorts of interventions, even though our interventions are pretty likely to backfire right now. But it can also be tempting to take our limitations seriously, uh, how, how limited our ability is to intervene in the lives of other animals in a clearly net positive way. 
and, and treat that as a license to ignore our responsibilities. We, we don't have these responsibilities to them in the first place. But I think those tendencies, while understandable, are wrong. If we want to be ethical citizens in, in this planet that we have created, then we have to acknowledge both parts of that equation first and foremost, and then figure out gradually, thoughtfully, ambitiously, radically, but also cautiously and humbly, we have to figure out how to move forward as a species in a way that uh, discharges our responsibilities to other animals and regarding other animals for public health and the environment. So I'll stop there, but just to say, again, thanks to everybody for doing this. I, I really appreciate it and I'm really looking forward to the commentaries and the discussion. Yeah, thanks so much for that uh, really good overview of the book and, and 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 setting us going on a number of paths. Actually, I think of, of interest to to many of us uh, working across the humanities and social sciences. In fact, so um, with that, uh, Raphael, I'm going to hand over to you and uh, look forward to your comments on on Jeff's book, and then we'll go to uh, Beth afterwards. Excellent. Thanks, and hi everyone, and thanks for inviting me to comment on Jeff's book and. Thanks, Jeff, again, for writing such a topical and thoughtful book. I, I very much enjoyed reading it. Uh, to my knowledge, at least, it is the first book to bring together arguments about the problems of factory farming, wildlife trade, deforestation, and to show why these things are interconnected and therefore need holistic solutions. And the book in this context makes a very compelling, I believe, and nuanced case for taking animals' interests seriously. Importantly, you make that case not just on the grounds that protecting animals is instrumentally useful, for instance, because it helps us fight climate change by, you know, shutting down um, maybe big factory farms, etc., or improve human health. Um, there's a lot of arguments out there already that are just instrumentally focused on animals, but you argue that we need to protect animals because they matter for their own sake. So that I found very, very interesting. Um, I also particularly liked the fact that the book presents its arguments in a humble and informed way, revealing the complexities and inevitable compromises that we have to understand and accept if we want to make this world a better place. Now, finally, I, you know, the book manages to do all of that in an exceptionally clear and lucid and also witty way. Um, for instance, I really like the section title, To Call or Not to Call. That is not the question. I really like that one. Um, now, I find myself agreeing with virtually all of the book and so was wondering if I can say anything other than you know just praise you for your achievement Jeff. Um, perhaps I would be doing everyone a favor if I just ended my remarks here by simply saying I agree well done Jeff uh, but I don't think it would make for a very interesting set of comments so in my short remark I will try to flag two points that I started to think about because of this very fact that the book offers so little to disagree with, or at least um, you know, from my perspective. Specifically, I propose that there is a way in which the book is perhaps doing too much and a way in which it is doing too little to achieve its aim. And I take that aim to be the expansion of our moral and political circle in a way that reduces and you know, perhaps ultimately ends factory farming, wildlife trade and deforestation. Let me start with the first respect in which I believe the book to be doing perhaps too much to achieve that aim. The book is one that explores some of the most intricate questions as to how people from different ethical vantage points can converge on a common set of measures to reduce harm to animals. And it does so by engaging with and rebutting objections to including animals in our circle of concern, discusses methods of including animals, and even deals with creation and population ethics and it's a testament, I think, to the book's intellectual rigor and sophistication that, you know, Jeff published it with the Oxford University Press. However, I wonder if the aim is to expand people's moral and political circle, why did Jeff decide to cast his arguments into an academic book published with OUP rather than a book published with a general publisher that has a broader reach and can therefore potentially get more people to expand their moral and political circles? Now, of course, these two projects are not mutually exclusive, and I would be curious to hear from Jeff if he has any plans to make the core arguments of the book accessible to the general public. Uh, for instance, it, it seemed to me that you know, considerations about the non-identity problem or the repugnant 
conclusion, they're very interesting intellectually, but I'm not sure they matter so much for achieving the aim of expanding people's moral and political circle more immediately. Um, and this is especially, I think, you know, given the many open questions and caveats that Jeff rightly leaves open um, in, in many places, um, you know, throughout the book. The core message of the book that we should reduce our use of animals as part of our pandemic and climate change mitigation efforts um, is quite a straightforward one, I think, that can be communicated without some of the perhaps analytical niceties um, and that many people agree with anyway, I think. So in some of them, I think due to its consideration of some rather abstract theoretical questions and its publication with an academic press, the book could potentially be said to be doing more than is needed to achieve its aim. However, at the same time, it might also be said that it is doing too little. The book does a great job, I think, trying to be ecumenical and showing how those adopting non-consequentialist approaches would agree with the thrust of Jeff's argument. But despite its emphasis on the importance of relationships, virtues, and other ethical values, the book is quite rationalistic in its presentation of the relevant issues. This is reflected, for instance, in its frequent use of thought experiments and its toying around with numbers. Now, you know, don't get me wrong, you know, such experiments and numbers, they have the role to play in a convincing account of why and how we should consider animals' interests. But I'm not so sure that they are sufficient to make people expand their moral and political circles. In fact, and unfortunately, um, rarely do people change their behavior simply because they find out that what they're doing is irrational or arbitrary, right? And I was therefore wondering if perhaps instead of one or the other, you know, thought experiment, it would have been more effective to adopt a different strategy in parts of the book. Um, I was thinking, for instance, about Lynn Hunt's argument in her book, Inventing Human Rights, that ultimately human rights only entered the mainstream with the emergence of epistolary novels, right? So these are books that are based on letter exchanges in which individual lives and sufferings of often lower class people were for the first time made evident to the higher classes and consequently made these higher classes more empathetic and receptive to the idea that all people have rights worth protecting. Richard Rorty made a similar point in his Amnesty Lectures on Human Rights. There, Rorty argued that we should understand human rights not by trying to identify the metaphysical foundations, but by how human rights are about telling sad emotional stories about the plight of some humans that move other humans to do something about it. Or perhaps even closer to Jeff's context, we may also think of how Peter Singer's Animal Liberation devotes considerable space and attention to describing animal suffering on farms and in laboratories. Now, I don't know for certain, but I would be surprised if this aspect of Singer's book, rather than just the core of its you know, philosophical argument, um, also played a very important role in its becoming a catalyst for the animal rights movement. And I wonder whether you know, Jeff's cause could uh, not perhaps also be benefited from some more emotional stories, as it were. Now, none of this really is to criticize the book as such. To have a rigorously argued academic book as a foundation, I think will be helpful to everyone who is trying to fight animal suffering, climate change, and deforestation. However, my comments may serve perhaps as an invitation to Jeff to elucidate some of the choices he made in the book. I'm sure they were very conscious choices, knowing him. And hopefully my comments will also serve as, a, as an encouragement to Jeff to keep writing on this very important topic in order to bring us closer to this aim of expanding people's moral and political circles. Thank you. I look forward to, to the discussion. Thank you very much, Raphael, for those comments. Um, our next uh, panelist is Beth Greenhow from the University of Oxford. And Beth, looking forward to, uh, to hearing your take on Jeff's book and to contributing to the ongoing discussion. And Jeff will we'll as assemble all the various comments and we'll bring those out in the discussion we have afterwards. So Beth, over to you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, thanks to Simon, to Jeff and to everyone for the opportunity to engage with Saving Animals, Saving Ourselves, which I found to be a really engaging, accessibly written book that challenges to seriously consider our obligations towards non-humans. Its central argument, the one that we need to find points of common ground across two distinct forms of moral reasoning, is one I've got a lot of sympathy with and one I've encountered in my work in looking at animal research professionals and seeing 
them and anti-vivisectionist activists find points of common ground around, for example, the widespread suffering of fish in commercial fishing and the impression no one's very bothered by this. So it's interesting to see an idea discussed in principle in the book that I've seen actually in practice on the ground. And at this point, I should probably add a disclaimer that I'm a social scientist by training and my own work is much more ethnographic. So I spent a lot of the time reading the book, um, constantly putting its arguments into conversations with lab animal care staff, vets, wildlife researchers, regulators, and other people I've met along the way. I think we can probably all agree that in most of these conversations, the devil's in the detail, but I don't want to turn this commentary into a case of here's the exception that proves the rule. Instead, I want to try and pick up on some moments where I think those conversations get interesting and resonate with some of the moral complexities I think Jeff sets out really well throughout his book. When it comes to the key argument, I think central to the case the book makes is the need to shift the terms of debate when it comes to placing animals within our moral and political frameworks. As Jeff puts it, the more we support radical change, the more we shift the centre of debate and pave the way for moderate change in the short to immediate term. And it calls us to address our failures of imagination, or what Don Haraway calls speculatively fabulate. Think about the stories we tell about possible human-animal futures and think of these as interventions we make into the present. It's the argument in the book I also found the most convincing, as again it's one I've seen at work in the field of animal research, where constant pressure both from within animal research in terms of personal moral struggles and emotional labour, but also from outside in the full vantage of a sectionist critique, has played a key role in promoting the reduction, refinement and replacement of animals in research. And while nominally this is framed as being very utilitarian in its moral approach, in practice um, the decision to work in animal research or to benefit from the products of animal research um, is often a complex relation on pluralistic ones. As Jeff says, like it or not, there's no way of avoiding moral complexity in the Anthropocene. But this argument towards finding commensurability is not one everyone would agree with. And I've been in some interesting conversations recently with Eva Girard about the risks of reconciliation and seeking common ground across conflicting moral and political positions. Notably, the idea that we might actually need moral friction to, in colloquial terms, keep us honest by challenging our beliefs and ideas. So, for example, in the case of animal research, those working within the field talk about how they value the challenge presented by activism as an opposition because it causes them to constantly question what they do and work towards reducing animal use in the future. So that was one point of kind of interesting friction for me. And there are a couple of others I wanted to pick up on as I move through. Firstly, um, which humans? So in saving ourselves, who exactly is the we we are saving? I think in places the book touches on the challenges faced by marginalised communities in achieving political representation. But the question of who exactly, who does and does not constitute the we we are saving for the large part remains open. This might well be, I think, one of the book's strategies. But many of those marginalised communities referred to have equally marginalised moral and philosophical frameworks, very different to many of those discussed in the book. I can't hope to do justice to these or fit them into the frameworks offered in the book here, and nor perhaps should I try to. But it does raise me the question about who, even within a pluralist moral framework, has the capacity to act and make their concerns and ways of understanding human-animal relations heard. My second question is around which animals, and I think this is one the book takes, takes on much more head-on. As Jeff notes, when we talk about saving animals, we immediately raise the question of which animals we should prioritise, assuming we cannot and perhaps should not save them all. And this kind of fungibility of species and spaces, or as Jeff puts it, the way we see non-humans as interchangeable parts of a whole, is in many ways a cornerstone of a lot of conservation accounting. From this perspective, it doesn't matter which species we save as long as we save some. At the same time, the irreplaceability of certain species, such as pandas or ecosystems like coral reefs, is a cornerstone of conservation campaigning. And these flagship species are therefore the ones we should save first. So as, as Jeff makes very clear in the book, we have this issue of prioritization. And currently I'd suggest this is done on the basis of biodiversity science, assumed sentience and sentiment or some combination of the three. So, for example, in Chapter 6, Jess discusses really nicely the tensions faced by those working in biodiversity conservation between a drive to save species and a recognition that doing so may entail directly inflicting harm or death on some individuals, such as those in invasive species or genetically impure hybrids. 
This is where sentience and sentiment come in, and both are problematic. Our limited ability to understand and know animal sentience makes judgments on this basis often highly subjective. While sentiment, or what my colleague Jamie Lorimer often calls non-human charisma, plays a key role in which species we might seek to save, with a decided preference for the most part for warm-blooded species who are big like us. Now, the approach Jeff offers to, 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 to dealing with this, as Raphael always mentioned, is, is a calculative one trying to address some of the uncertainties and partialities or biases we may have in making these choices. But I want to ask if there might be other ways we might want to make choices between human and animal futures that might involve perhaps thinking of some of my colleagues in um, Bakawa County in Australia, obligations towards country or towards family or towards human and non-human kin. These too might inform our priorities. Or equally, we might look to the framework of animal labor and think about the rights and responsibility of animals as co-workers or as part of complex infrastructures of ecosystem service provision. And I think this offers particularly interesting possibilities, not least because some environmental initiatives, especially those term nature-based solutions, actually rely on making more use of animals through things like regenerative agriculture or rewilding. They actually rely on increasing our use of animals in particular ways on non-human animal labor. And then finally, if we're saving animals, to what ends are we doing so? What are we saving animals from and what are we saving them for? And here I found Jeff's use of the quality of life index particularly interesting, as it asks us to think about the value of life not just in terms of quantity, but also quality, or what we might term a life worth living. And again, this question is central to where I work in animal research and in other areas of human animal use, where generations of breeding and other forms of reproductive intervention create animals for whom to live is effectively to suffer. Are such lives worth living? And more importantly, how would we know? As Jeff asks, do we harm animals with bad lives simply by bringing them into existence? And here, perhaps, there's another really interesting point of tension in seeking this kind of moral reconciliation, a tension between the right to life and the right to a good life or even to a humane death. In the hypothetical lab animal examples in chapter two, Jeff gives us, there's a focus on the number of animals killed. And throughout the book, I found often harming and killing were treated collectively. Yet from a welfareist or utilitarian position, death is often not seen as a welfare problem. Indeed, in some cases, if we look, for example, at veterinary ethics, the key problem is often not killing or euthanasia and prolonging the suffering of an animal simply because that's what the owner wants. In this case, we could argue saving beloved pet animals to save ourselves from the emotional impact of their loss is morally wrong. Okay, so to summarize then, four perhaps not so small questions. Firstly, are there drawbacks to pluralist moral frameworks, especially in terms of reducing productive moral frictions? Secondly, which humans, or to put it another way, whose moral frameworks are prioritized within this kind of pluralist moral position? Thirdly, which animals and how do we decide? Is it about sentience and sentiment? Is it about calculation? Or is it about obligations to non-human kin or to co-workers? And fourthly, how do we tackle the issues that arise when the goals of reducing suffering and reducing killing don't easily align? Or um, a question I would love to have answered, is death a welfare problem? And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beth, so much. A really interesting set of questions. I'm looking forward to uh, to picking those up in the conversation shortly. Um, our third and final panelist uh, is John Adenateri, and looking forward, John, to hearing uh, your comments. Obviously, from a legal perspective, we've 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 heard a little bit from some other disciplinary perspectives, but um, yeah, looking forward to hearing what you can bring to the conversation, and then uh, to uh, pick these pick these up with Jeff shortly. Thank you very much, Simon, and uh, thank you very much to the other panelists and the attendees of today's uh, event. But most of all, thank you to Jeff for writing such a wonderful book. And uh, uh, whenever someone finishes a book, uh, the, the compliments that have to be paid are not just because, not irrespective of the outcome. Even if he had written a terrible book, which is not the case, just going through the labor emotional uh, labor of writing a book uh, which presumably took you uh, several years especially during a time of, of pandemic and war and, and general disaster uh, well we we have to say really congratulations to you and in fact the book is an excellent book 
so congratulations both uh, in form and, and in substance. And it's such a good book, it's such a fantastic book, because the, the central arguments it makes are arguments that are unfortunately sorely needed. Uh, the argument and the thesis is straightforward. We cannot just care about humans when we're thinking about climate change, pandemics and other catastrophe. We need to, uh, to care about other animals too. And the reason for this, irrespective of the moral framework, whether we use a consequentialist framework or we use a rights-based framework, is that animals, or at least most of them, are sentient. Yes, they, they have the ability to experience their own well-being. They have a subjective uh, experience. So they can feel pain, they can feel pleasure, uh, they, can have, they have desires, they have wishes. They have um, a first-person perspective. So in this sense, Jeff out outlines that whichever moral framework we adopt, um, animals are moral persons. Um, they're moral subjects. We owe them moral duties, and or or we need to, uh, in any event, uh, especially from from a consequentialist framework, consider their well-being, yeah, the pleasure, the pain that our actions um, and, uh, are are causing, and we we do cause uh, pain and, uh, and sometimes pleasure, but especially pain to animals given. Uh, given climate change, given the ex uh, some catastrophes like bushfires uh, that are caused by humans, etc., etc. But we should not forget uh, why animals are important. They're important, uh, at least this is my understanding, Jeff, of your work, because they are sentient beings. Uh, and and so I, I totally then uh, agree with the with uh, the majority of, of the book. Uh, it follows that if if we care about humans, uh, we should care about animals too. <laughs> if climate change harms humans and if it harms animals, then we, we need to do something about that. We need to um, put in, in place mitigation and prevention efforts. And some of the policies that Jeff suggests, such as doing more research, more advocacy, uh, thinking about our our architecture, our infrastructures in ways that are more animal friendly, thinking about our legal and political um, uh, institutions in a way that they can incorporate and protect and take into account as much as possible the interest of non-human animals, I think follows straightforwardly from this initial moral commitment that animals matter because they are, they are sentient. So there goes the there goes the uh, the same um, the same problem that Raphael encounters. If there's so much in this book that I agree with, uh, what what else can I say? Well, there there are some some issues that I think that uh, one issue in particular. I think there is a bit of a, a contrast, um, a conflict in some of what you've said, especially the animals matter because. The ascending and your commitment to bring into this framework future generations, including future generations of animals and non-human animals alike. So, um, in I think chapter eight, uh, you describe a situation where actually, if, um, especially from a, a consequentialist perspective, if uh, we we should care about other sentient beings, especially those in the future, then it may be that we do not have moral reason to stop climate change today. Why so? Because in, it may be, as you said even in the introduction to this talk, that uh, climate change expands certain animal populations uh, while it decreases some. So it may be that uh, if that climate change actually uh, overall benefits more animals, more sentient animals, than uh, it undermines them. But this is only by taking the interest of future animals, say, um, say that climate change creates many, many more sentient uh, insects in the future. And so overall, from a numbers perspective at least, 
many more individuals will be created by, uh, be, will be benefited by climate change, then it seems that, uh, con very counterintuitively, we have a duty to prevent climate change. Um, so, what, what's the way out of this trick? Seems like a, a terrible, terrible scenario that we have a moral duty uh, to not to prevent climate change. That, that seems to be the exact opposite of, of, the, of the title um, of, your, uh, of, of the general argument. Well, I think the problem here is that uh, we have to remember, or a possible solution, and I don't think it's a solution at all, and I'll, I'll, I'll say that say more about that later, is that perhaps we do not have a moral duty towards future generations, whether they are animals or non-animals. Uh, and I say that because, remember, when we started this discussion, um, that our duties are towards sentient beings, the fact that beings that can experience, that can feel pain, that are subjective, that uh, have a first-person perspective. Well, future generations, at least at the moment, do not have uh, this first-person first person uh, perspective. They are not, um, so as such, they are not sentient. Yet, of course, we could say that in the future they will be, so, they will be sentient, and so that uh, increases our the moral duties, that engages our moral duties uh, towards them. But it's, it's, this seems to, to be counterintuitive, at least in one respect, which is that uh, our moral responsibilities are usually time sensitive. So if there is a, a criminal that is about to commit an offence, then we, we have a duty to stop them. But say that they are many years from committing the offence. Say that they, um, uh, they are still a, a young person, a, a child, and for some reason we have some technology and we are able to stop them from now. It would, it would go against uh, several moral intuitions, uh, at least on a, on a right space framework, for us to stop the child now many years before they have uh, committed the crime. And, and what does this have to do with, with anything? Well, it, it means that our, our duties, at least this, this, is my, this is my intuition, is that the duties that we owe to sentient beings are time sensitive. So if a being is not sentient at the moment, then we have no present duties, moral duties, to them. Um, so I, I, would, I, I think that this, uh, this situation, the situation I was describing before, where um, we may have a duty to uh, accelerate climate change because it may benefit more sentient beings in the future, Actually, um, that's one possible way to, to resolve this, to say that actually we do not have duty towards, towards future generations because future generations are not sentient beings, full stop. They may be sentient beings in the future, and when they are sentient beings in the future, then, um, then we may have any moral duties towards them. So, I, I find that, so in, in, what I'm trying to say here is that the, the inclusion in your book of duties towards future generations seems to me at least problematic. It's not, it's not, it doesn't seem to me to, um, to correspond very neatly to, uh, on your sentence-based framework. The framework that says basically we need to include animals because they're sentient beings and we have moral duty towards sentient beings. So I think there's a there's there's a friction at least uh, between between this uh, these two commitments, and I would like to, to perhaps uh, say more about this uh, later. But in any event, uh, this was a, a fantastic book, and I'm so glad that uh, it's been written. And I and I endorse Raphael's message that uh, more should be done, especially to popularise uh, this book. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for those comments as well. And we have about 10, 15 minutes where we can talk through. Perhaps we can go a little bit longer, even Jeff, uh, since there's a fairly substantial range of, of queries and questions and, 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 and desires for, for, for further discussion. 
Um, and I don't want to, you know, come come in here with a whole bunch of questions of my, of my own. I have, I have many. I mean, I think this is it's such an interesting topic. But I'll just say one thing, picking up on what John was alluding to at the end there, and 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 talking about, you know, taking things further. And and one thing I wouldn't mind you kicking off this discussion part of the of, of the seminar with is a bit of reflection about where we're at. You know, a lot of these questions are, are as John points out there, on the intergenerational uh, duties question phased phrased in a in a setting of 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 secular changes over longer time periods i mean we have sort of debates about the anthropocene and the, and the ways in which things may be may be transforming over over periods of decades and, and longer but where are we at already in terms of some of the things that are being addressed you've you've engaged in the sort of agenda 2030 process and looking at how the sdgs do and don't include various aspects of this agenda so there are things happening there are areas in which governments and societies are beginning to accommodate rights of animals in different ways and different settings. Where would you say we are at on that kind of journey? Obviously, fairly near the beginning, I would imagine. But 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 what's already happening and what kind of uh, insights does that give you from the point of view of your of your argument for how you think some of this is going to play out? We've got a lot of, you know, discussion from the from the panelists and from yourself about the ways in which we think you know, different rights regimes, different philosophical positions give us a an answer or not to some of these 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 quite quite long standing questions. But but in the world of policy and practical uh, decision making, where are we already on that on that journey? Okay, great. Well, well, thank you all four of you for for these great comments and and questions. I, I really appreciate your your careful and your generous readings of the book. I of course appreciate your kind words about the book, but also the questions and challenges, which I think are really good ones, and and I'm looking forward to to discussing. So I'll start, Simon, with with your question, and then and then go through the the comments in order, and and again try to be brief while while still addressing the the core questions so first of all where are we at you suggested my answer which is we are very early in this process uh, uh some philosophers for example will mccaskill in his work on what we owe the future described humanity as a teenager <laughs> that is starting to figure things out but still has a lot of work to do in order to develop and, and mature and, and so we are at this crossroads where we are starting to have some power and influence, but are not yet uh, intellectually or emotionally prepared to wield that power and influence responsibly. And, and we really need to start doing that. Now we are starting to figure that out in bits and pieces here and there. Cities, states, countries, international bodies are bringing in some of these considerations at the margins. Frameworks like One Health are, are emphasizing the links between human and and animal and environmental health frameworks like the Green New Deal are emphasizing the leaks between social and economic and environmental justice. The Sustainable Development Goals at the United Nations are doing the same. And so these are really good foundations to, to, to build on, but we do need to build on them because even these quite expansive frameworks that emphasize all of these connections are not doing that nearly enough. Uh, we, we are not through the One Health approach engaging with food as much as we should be, nor are we seeing animal health and well-being and rights as intrinsically significant. We, we mostly view them as significant only insofar as they impact human health and, and well-being and rights. So, so we do have signs that we can make progress. We have enough engagement with these issues to, to give us some hope and optimism for the future. But, but we are only at step one of the process right now. And, and so any kind of just multi-species society that we can eventually construct is going to look much different from anything that we currently have is, is I think the, the first thing that I would say. And the, the past few years I think have been especially good evidence of this because on one hand, during the past few years, we have seen a global pandemic that raises questions about our interactions with other animals and fires and floods and, and other disasters that show what types of risks climate change and other disruptions can impose on human and non-human animals. And, and that has spurred more discussion about these links and these issues than we have ever seen before and more action than we've ever seen before. Uh, China in, in spring 2020 banned in important respects the wildlife trade. 
uh, in, in the time since then, many jurisdictions, countries, have banned mink farming and fur farming in light of the, the risk of disease spread uh, on, on these farms. And so actions have been taken. But even during this time of profound disruption, not enough discussion has happened and not enough action has been taken. And we can expect that as the world tries to move on from COVID or, or pretends that we already are moving on from COVID, we can expect that these discussions will happen less. And so we have some signs for optimism and some signs for pessimism. And the task is to take enough swift action now so that we can justify the optimism that we need to hold on to in order to move on from this adolescent state that our species is still in. So that is, is my answer to, to your question, Simon, and happy to discuss that more. Now, going back to the comments, starting with Raphael, I really like your, your feedback that in important respects, the book both does too much and too little. And, and I think you are putting your finger on attention that I felt when I was writing the book, because of course this type of book can serve many different audiences and many different purposes. And it started out as, believe it or not, much more of an academic book than it ended up being. It, it started out as a conventionally academic book for an academic press about some of the moral and political questions that, that animals and, and public health and climate change raise. But as I was writing it, I was doing more engagement with advocates and policymakers, and then we entered the era of COVID-19 and the Australia bushfires and, and so on and so forth. And, and so I started to feel uh, motivation to, to engage with those sorts of scientific and advocacy and policy issues more in the book. But instead of swinging to the other end of the spectrum, I attempted, for better or worse, to strike a balance between uh, a scholarly text and then a general audience text. And, and I recognize that that might make my book not optimal either as a scholarly work or as a general audience work. But I thought for better or worse, I would write the book that best reflects what I was thinking about and, and what I thought was important to convey and what I was best positioned to be thinking about and conveying. And, and I think that where my strengths are is saying here are the issues and here is how they interact and, and here is how we need to think about them in this integrated and holistic way if we want to make our advocacy and policy ethical and effective. And that does mean going for breadth rather than depth and, and talking about all of these issues, hopefully in an accessible and engaging way, but then emphasizing their connections. Uh, and, and that did crowd out the kind of emotional storytelling that I think would, would perhaps make the book resonate more for a general audience. And, and it might be that a longer book that includes that or, or that includes that instead of some of the issues that I discussed might have been better. But yeah, my, my reason for, for taking that approach was that I thought my comparative advantage is showing how all these issues interact, showing what it might look like to pursue health and environmental advocacy and policy in a way that thoughtfully integrates all of these issues and and then to offer that to others so that then their storytelling their advocacy their policy could reflect uh the the combination of ideas that that i put into the book because if you take any of them out duties to future generations interspecies comparisons of welfare uh or or various health or environmental impacts then it could result in um narrow, narrow advocacy or policy that leaves out lots of the stakeholders whom I think we have a responsibility to. Um, so, so yeah, that, that was the hope. I put it out there and see, see if it resonates with people. And, and I guess we can see and go from there. But I'm very open to continuing to talk about these ideas and packaging them in different ways for different audiences. And I'm also very open to other people taking the baton and, and doing that as well, especially if they are good storytellers and, and if, if that is a strength of theirs. So, so that's uh, my main response to you. But, but yeah, uh, very, very receptive to that feedback. Um, Beth, lots of good questions and challenges here. So I'll try to go quickly, quickly through them and then we can discuss more. Um, so first of all, there are, I agree, risks of seeking common ground. So, so I do aspire in this book to show where we might be able to have consensus or if not consensus then compromise and some kind of basis for coalition building across animal groups and and health groups and environmental groups and human rights groups and so on and so forth uh, but but i agree with you that it can be ineffective and counterproductive to seek 
broad coalitions or unity in a way that papers over differences or um, gets rid of tension or conflict, because I do think that we need tension and conflict because that generates discussion which challenges us. It gets us to avoid dogma, to improve our beliefs over time and to change our minds and, and so on. Uh, and, and so, and, and to of course, like call out and get rid of bad actors and bad ideologies, which is also important. Um, but I actually think the right kind of coalition building actually increases productive tension rather than decreasing productive tension. Because if we all stay in our little silos, which is increasingly a risk in the age of social media algorithms, we all get in our little bubbles and only talk to and hear from people in our bubbles and just dunk on people in other <laughs> communities. Uh, if, if we do that, then we don't have the kind of productive friction with other beliefs and values and practices. We only have unproductive friction. We only see the worst versions of those other ideas and it reinforces our own ideology. But when we build coalitions around common values, around a baseline of, of common beliefs and common values, then it puts us in the right kind of constructive, charitable engagement with people with whom we partly agree and partly disagree. And then that creates space for them, I think, productive discussion and disagreement about the issues that we still disagree about. And, and so that's the kind of uh, balance that, that I, I would, want to call for. And, and so I think what we should do is try to build coalitions around goals that we can share right now, uh, phasing down factory, for, factory farming, deforestation, the wildlife trade, including animals and health and environmental advocacy and policy. Um, build coalitions around those goals, spend the next 10, 20, 30 years <laughs> achieving those goals. And along the way, talk about the areas where we still disagree. For example, Will, will there be any animal products at all in the future? Or will, will it be 95% plant-based and 5% animal-based? Or will it just be 100% plant-based and not at all animal-based, right? Um, we, should, we should pursue an elimination of factory farming together and then debate those issues over time so that we can then have a thoughtful approach when the time comes to deal with that remaining 5% of animal use. Um, okay, which humans, who is the we? So, so I agree with you that uh, we need to take very seriously this question about who we are here. And one thing that I emphasize in the book is that when I say we have this responsibility, that, that uh, first person plural is directed in the first instance to say the global 1%, the humans who have the, the most wealth and power and the nations that have the most wealth and power and actually the most complicity and responsibility. So, so who has the most power to make change and who is most responsible because of past activity and the way they benefit from that past activity for making change. And, and I think that it is our responsibility as the individuals who, who are best positioned to make changes, but also most, most responsible for making changes to in various ways take the lead on transforming the world so that it can be more humane and healthful and sustainable for everyone. But then part of what that means, and this is where I, I agree with you, part of what that then means is distributing wealth, distributing power, democratizing decision-making procedures so that previously marginalized or excluded individuals and communities who will be disproportionately impacted by these problems are empowered to um, participate in global efforts to solve these problems. Um, so, I, so I do think that we need to take seriously our responsibility as members of the global 1%, but then part of what it looks like to take responsibility is bringing others into the process and making sure they have the resources that they need to participate in these efforts without undermining their ability to make ends meet uh, or their ability to develop and, and so on and so forth, which I take it as part of the power of the sustainable development goals framework that that Yes, uh, we all need to develop sustainably. And part of what that means is wealthy nations distribute wealth to uh, lower income nations so that they can distribute in a sustainable, sorry, that they can develop in a sustainable manner. And the same is going to be true of other types of uh, marginalized or minoritized stakeholders. So that's my general answer. Uh, and we, we can discuss details and I'd love to do that. Um, as for how to figure out which non-humans to include and how much to consider sentience and sentiment as opposed to other ways of thinking about animals like kin or coworkers. So I basically think that we need to do both and. Uh, I, I do personally think that 
which animals have sentience, have consciousness, have subjective lives of their own, whether we like it or not, that is relevant to whom we need to protect and how we need to protect them. Uh, wh whether it feels like something to be them and it feels good or bad to be in this situation. Uh, I, I, I think that that does matter, but I agree with you that it is really hard to answer those questions. And especially right now, given the limits of our knowledge, it involves a lot of subjectivity and a lot of bias and ignorance. And I think a lot of people are tempted to say, well, then we need to find some other basis for deciding whom to include and care about since this one is so fraught and full of bias and ignorance. But that is unfortunately not how ethics works. <laughs> when, 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 you know, ethics is hard when, when we have no idea who counts as sentient or what makes their lives better or worse. We don't get to, and I'm not saying that this is what you were suggesting, but we don't then get to draw the line in a different place or, or, or find a different metric. No, we just need to accept ethics is hard and muddle through as best we can. And so part of my book is, is saying, we need to take this seriously because this does matter, but we are currently bad at figuring out what it requires of us. And so step one is to do the scientific and philosophical work that we need to do in order to better understand who is sentient and what their lives are like so that that can inform our decision making. But that should not be the only input to our decision making. And, and this is partly a response to several of you who talked about the fact that I talk numbers in this book. And a critique that people often level against people who use math in order to set public policy is that the math is simplistic and reductive and it leaves out all sorts of other considerations that are important, like relationships, like virtues. Uh, it, it, it reduces us in our lives to numbers, and it can also involve a lot of injustices. For example, if we do our math in a way that makes bad assumptions about the value of certain lives and in, in a way that privileges uh, younger people over older people or non-disabled people over disabled people or humans over non-humans, right? So the math is both incomplete and it can often involve bias and ignorance in a way that privileges some people over other people. I think all of that's right, but I don't think that is a reason not to do math. I think that is a reason to do math well and then supplement it with other legal and political frameworks too. So in the human case, when we need to set public policy, we should be doing math because math is the only way to uh, reveal these really important but diffuse and otherwise in invisible impacts that a problem can have across a population. Otherwise, we only respond to the salient harms and we ignore the chronic, uh, widely distributed harms that end up impacting people a lot in the aggregate. So we need to do the math in order to reveal those harms and care about them. But we also need things like rights frameworks, justice frameworks, um, and serious engagement with and consideration of um, issues like racism, sexism, classism, ageism, ableism, speciesism, so that we're doing our math in an informed and ethical way. And we're uh, restricting the way we try to uh, improve well-being in the population with things like rights and justice. And when we do those things together, we do the math in a way that's informed by and restricted by rights and justice frameworks, that I think is the right balance, rather than overcorrecting by eliminating math, even though we somehow need to set po public policy for populations that include hundreds of millions of humans and trillions of non-human animals. Uh, there's no way around some math. Uh, okay. Um, what happens when suffering and I'll, I'll again try to go quickly from here. What, what happens when suffering and death conflict? Yeah, this is one of those areas where it will start to matter what your beliefs and values are. And there might be some disagreement, even though there can be some matters of agreement. You note that, for example, for utilitarians who want to maximize happiness and minimize suffering, what really matters is suffering, not death. Uh, whereas for rights theorists, for example, death might intrinsically matter because you have an intrinsic right to life. Right? Now, as, as a short note, I do think actually death matters for utilitarians in part because part of the calculation is not just suffering, but also happiness, and death can deprive you of future happiness, right? So, so in that sense, at least, death can be a harm for utilitarians if it results in a deprivation of, of future happiness, either for you or for other people, or if it causes suffering for you or for other people. Um, but I agree with you that there is going to be some debate there. So I think we can generally agree that the kind of suffering and death inflicted 
via factory farming and deforestation and the wildlife trade is generally bad for animals and humans, both because the suffering and the death are present. So the suffering, deprivation of happiness, and rights violations are all there. And so the utilitarians and rights theorists can agree, this stuff is bad. And then because of the impacts that it has on humans via worker exploitation and global health and environmental impacts, we can agree from utilitarians and right frameworks, this is bad for humans too. So again, I think we can start there, uh, build coalitions around the need to end these practices that are bad for everyone by all frameworks, and then negotiate the the other harder cases along the way for example where i wonder should i kill these beings or prevent them from increasing their populations because they seem to have net negative welfare those will be the kinds of cases where then we start to disagree which is why i introduced those questions towards the end of the book and those questions are hard but we can start with the areas where we disagree and then tackle those harder questions along the way um finally john I love your question about future generations. So let me just briefly respond. And my response won't be an argument so much as an assertion. <laughs> then we can we can maybe talk about it more in, in the discussion, which is that I, I simply reject the idea that, that future generations lack moral status at present. I think that we have obligations to at least all sentient beings, no matter who they are, no matter where they live, no matter when they live, and no matter what social or biological categories they occupy. My, my general view about this is that to uh, exclude future generations from our sphere of moral or legal or political concern is in principle no different from excluding members of other nations or members of other biological categories. It, it essentially um, denies moral and legal and political consideration to someone whose well-being is being impacted by our activity simply on the basis of uh, where or when uh, or in what communities they happen to live through no faults of their own. Uh, and if someone is a stakeholder in our activity, if, if they have lives that matter to them, and if their well-being is impacted by our activity and they have no opportunity to, to participate in those decisions, I think we have a responsibility to consider their interests, their well-being, their rights. Uh, when, when making decisions that foreseeably are going to impact them. And that includes members of other nations, that includes members of uh, future generations, and it includes members of other species. So I do think that we have a responsibility to consider them. And, you know, if we care about climate change, presumably part of that is because of its impacts on future generations, right? Uh, if, if we're in this discussion about climate ethics in the first place, I would presume that, that part of the reason is, is that we care about what world we are going to leave to the future. Um, so my solution to this problem that you've, I think, rightly identified is different than yours. The problem you identified is, hey, there's a tension here, because for most of the book, I'm saying we need to, to end pandemics and end climate change, or at least limit the, the destructiveness of pandemics and climate change, partly by reducing our use of non-human animals and increasing our support for them. But then at the end, surprise, if we care about animals a lot, we need to recognize that climate change is going to have mixed effects on animals. It diminishes biodiversity and contracts some species, but it expands others. And some of those animals will have bad lives, but others will have good lives. And we need to consider all of that to get a full accounting. And, and then you note, wait a minute, but does that undermine the entire rest of the book? Because it suggests that climate change might not be bad after all. So part of why I want to talk about that is I think actually that is a serious question that we need to confront. If we're going to be non-speciesist, we can't simply assume that something is bad in general simply because it's bad for humans. We have to really ask, is it good or bad in general? Um, but here's why I think climate change is bad in general. I think one of the most important things to do in the short term, by which I mean uh, the next like 500 to 1,000 years, one of the most important things we need to do in the short term is um, prevent humanity from destroying the entire world via the many existential threats humanity is creating and is otherwise facing so that we can secure the possibility of a positive long-term future for humans and non-humans alike. And pandemics and climate change are threat multipliers. They are highly disruptive uh, things that even if in the short term, 
they might be better for some animals. They're going to so fundamentally destabilize and disrupt our communities and societies that they're going to uh, reduce the possibility that we can survive the very difficult next 500 to 1,000 years. Uh, they're going to reduce the possibility that we can survive that era long enough to get our acts together and secure a positive long-term future for all sentient beings. And so for the time being, even if in the short to medium term, climate change might have mixed effects on other animals, I think in the long term, it would have net negative effects on other animals because it diminishes our ability to survive the next period and create a future where we can do right by them. And that's what I think we should be aiming for. Now that's highly speculative uh, and, and worthy of discussion and debate, but that's my view. And I'll stop there and I look forward to uh, whatever else you might care to say. Jeff, thanks for those thoughts. I mean, you've, I, I think you respond to some of the questions very effectively and the panelists should feel very welcome to raise their hand if they wanna come back in at some point. But let me just pick up on one thing you say there at the end. You, Essentially, you, you sort of, and this, and this goes back a little bit also to your point about the, the value of math, right, and that particular approach to making and forming arguments, and that's really the game that we're in here partly. And I would say another important way of doing that is history. You know, a lot of these arguments based upon the idea of things that may change in the future, so we're having this discussion about duties to future, future generations or to... And I'm suspecting that John might be saying, well, one way that you would be able to draw a line between those things could be that it's whether or not our lives really do impact upon them. So there might be boundaries that one could draw around that. But then that's sort of in a sense the argument of, of someone like I am young who says, well, our responsibilities partly bear out upon the impact that we have. You mentioned the word complicity earlier on. So the extent to which we have been complicit in structures that affect others, in a sense, determines whether or not we are able to do it. And that brings me to the to the history point, because a lot of these discussions are about politics in a, shall we say, dialogic form. And there's a lot of politics that is much more about conquest, that is about the use of power. And I wondered where animals fit into that aspect of politics in your account, to the extent when, for example, the conquistadors arrive in Latin America, to what extent are animals a part of the capacity to control other populations? The same with agriculture and species management in the Indian subcontinent and the global networks of trade that that then enables. So are there ways in which control over animals is itself a part of humans controlling each other through different social and racial and other forms and does that then bring us back partly to Beth's question about the about the we and then partly also to her I think proposed solution to that which is to look at other forms of politics that have resisted those particular forms of overt um, conquest and uh, manipulation and um, yeah subjugation for example, histories of labor activism and so forth, and how animals may be co-opted into that, so that the effect that we get at the end is not simply applying current liberal accounts of justice to some of these problems, but actually then rethinking what we mean by some of those accounts of justice. And my sense of, of your work is that this offers us a way to enrich some of those categories by bringing, bringing animals back in. So, yeah, could you just say a few, few words about how, how, in a sense, that, that other side of the political coin plays out in your account and where animals fit into them? Yeah, thank you. And I like that connection with, with Beth's comments as well. Uh, I'll, I'll just briefly reply that I, I, I think that is a great point and, and the use of animals in conquest and control of human populations needs to be really seriously considered and is starting to be seriously considered in the field of animal studies. There are all kinds of connections between human and non-human oppressions, parallels and interactions and shared or root causes. And I think this is among them, the ways in which exploitation of animals can contribute to exploitation of humans because animals are wielded against humans as weapons or, or other types of objects of control. Uh, and, and, you know, use of animals in police and military is one example of that. And there are others. So I just think that is a wonderful point and I endorse it um, to, to briefly address the kinds of deeper questions that you raise there. I do think that uh, animals can nevertheless still be part of human work uh, and human communities and and um, regarding animals as having the capacity to work and offer their labor is worthwhile. But given their dependence and vulnerability, it's especially important to uh, 
avoid doing the, those in exploitative ways and, and to make sure that their agency and their autonomy and their well-being are respected in the same way that we would do for human workers. And so the work that people are doing right now to develop frameworks where animals can be taken seriously as workers with labor rights, I think is really valuable because it strikes that balance between on one hand, using them exploitatively, but on the other hand, not using them at all, even in ways where they would benefit from being put to, to work in, in ways that are consistent with their health and well-being and rights. So, so I just endorse that trend of, of uh, developing those, those ideas and those frameworks. Um, and, and the deeper issue is that uh, there's always a tension between on one hand, wanting to improve existing systems so that they include marginalized communities more um, equitably versus challenging them and replacing them entirely, right? And I think that we need both kinds of activities happening at once. We need people thinking about how we might improve uh, labor frameworks and, and ideals like liberalism, democracy, and capitalism to be properly um, anti-racist and classist and so on and anti-speciesist. But then we also need people wondering what the world might look like if we replace them with radical alternatives. It's only through both streams of thought that we can really think about all of our options and make informed choices about how to develop from here. So I'll, I'll uh, stop there. Well, thanks, that was a really interesting reflection. I don't know if any of the panelists do have any thoughts they wanted to come, come, come back in on. Please be very welcome to do so. We have uh, four or five minutes left in our, in our discussion. I mean, just on that, on that last point then, Jeff, I mean, you know, we are in a sense, and I wonder whether we are, in a sense, the, you know, the sort of the, the, the Singer, Peter Singer approach on, on a lot of these questions, I can imagine would be something like, well, you know, we, we therefore have an obligation to do these things, you know, that, that, that there is the life that we can save, as it were, and that argument. Is that, in, is, is that the line that you're taking this, or is yours, I get the sense partly from, from the, the discussion, more a sort of co-creative diagnostic one that we need to continue chipping away at the realm of what we can understand to develop the right ideas rather than saying we necessarily have an obligation to act in a certain uh, definable way with certain sets of metrics that we can then suggest we have improved and you know and so on and so forth down the usual policy route. Both and honestly so so uh, Peter Singer famously argues in, in uh, multiple works, but m most famously uh, his his essay famine affluence and morality that if something very bad is happening and we have the power to prevent that from happening without sacrificing anything comparably significant, we should do it. You see a kid drowning in a pond, you can save them without doing anything more than getting your clothes muddy. You should save the kid right uh, and and I do agree with that, and I think that actually follows both from utilitarian and rights frameworks that that you should do that when you have the power to do it um, now, a common response to that is, yeah, but the world is a lot more complicated than that. You keep saving kids from ponds rather than dealing with the structures that cause them to fall into ponds, then you are not going to do much good in the long run. We should be seeking these more foundational structural changes. But in response to that, Singer says, and I agree, okay, fine, then do that. <laughs> My point is that you should put a lot of thought into figuring out how you can ethically and effectively reduce suffering in the world without sacrificing anything significant. And, and then you should do that. And if that means saving the kid from the pond, do that. If it means building a fence around the pond to keep the kids from falling in, do that. But we should do something rather than just spending all of our money on fancy dinners and, and trips. Uh, when we could instead be uh, improving the lives of the most vulnerable, whose vulnerability we are partly responsible for. Um, and my, my argument in the book is, yeah, that is right, but the world is really complicated, so it probably will be some combination of saving some kids from ponds here and there, but then mostly investing in resources that will in the future create structural solutions that will prevent the problems from arising in the first place. And I see Beth has your hand up. Yeah, just wanted to come in. I've been looking at a few of the comments in the chat as well, and there's a sort of general sense that, that as humans, we have a responsibility to act, seems to be coming across here. So we have to jump in and save the kid in the pond. Um, I suppose my thought is, what if there's somebody on the other side of the pond that's way more qualified than I am to jump in and save the kid? Is that the point where I need to maybe, instead of jumping in and, and acting, to stand back and listen? And that, that's sort of coming back to the point about, about we again, in that there are other solutions are the political philosophical traditions ways of thinking that don't even have the um, separation between human and animal in the first place in some cases um, and I think is as well as acting we need to learn when to to stand back and listen and make space for those other approaches to, to take center stage yes I agree I think that we we should be doing more of that 
Uh, and, you know, I, I intend the book to be a contribution in a much broader discussion, uh, but of course not the, the final word on the discussion and, and the ideas that I develop in the book are not meant to be the only ideas that are part of the discussion. I, I do think that what all of us, especially those of us with privileged identities and backgrounds have a responsibility to do is to listen and be humble, be cautious, realize that we are not always the saviors that we think we are. <laughs> and often we, we do as much harm as good or more harm than good. Um, and to really try to build a coalition, not only because a coalition will be more effective, but also because a coalition will represent a certain kind of justice or equity that can sometimes be lacking when people try to take it upon themselves to solve the world's problems. Um, so so I, I do very much think that we need to take insights from indigenous communities, work together with indigenous communities, distribute resources and power to communities that have previously lacked it, uh, in part because of unjust and oppressive systems. Uh, we should be doing all of that, um, and we should challenge the dualism and separation between humans and non-humans in the first place. But again, we shouldn't overcorrect in, in all of these ways. There are real differences between humans and non-humans, and some of them concern our responsibilities for the problems that we've created. So we need to take animal agency and autonomy seriously. We need to blur the distinction between species a lot but not in a way that allows us to abdicate our responsibility for the problems that we've created. We, we do need to um, regard ourselves as distinct in that, in that uh, respect, at least to some degree. Raphael, you've got your hand up. We're very near the end of the thing. Did you have a quick comment? Very brief, I just wanted to draw our attention to a comment in a chat from Hazel Earwaker, who I think makes a really interesting point about the sort of political system that might be most suitable to achieving the kinds of change that morally we ought to be achieving. And the question being, are, democracy re are democracies really that well suited given how sort of short term focused they are? Or might we potentially be looking at a more despotic system potentially as being the more effective one? I just thought it's a thought provoking uh, comment. Well, it ties yeah. in as well with the comment from Jamie as well and that, that he's also made about being, being prudent, not necessarily being, what can get us to where we need to be. But I think I think it is about a mix, right? And 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 it's about moving when you have the right basis to do so, which is about about knowing more. I mean, Jeff, I'll let you finish off on this this final comment and then I'll and then I'll I'll thank you all before we leave. So, sounds good. And, and just a note to, to people whose questions we didn't get to, uh, I would love to talk with anyone who has interest in talking and you're very welcome to send me an email. My email is jeffcebo at gmail.com or nyu.edu. EDU. And, and again, thank you to everybody. So to, to answer that question, I think that is a really deep and important question. And we are living in a perilous time right now, in part because we are living in this age of conflict for political power between democracies and autocracies and other various types of political systems. And there are all sorts of rights and justice questions that are in the mix here. But another question is which type of system can be most effective if a big part of what we need to be doing is planning for the long-term future and allowing ourselves to be patient and careful. And one thing that democracies have been not that great at is thinking in terms of the long-term future because they tend to think in terms of electoral cycles. And so people will focus on two to four year time horizons rather than 1,000 or million or billion year time horizons, which is ultimately what justice is going to require. And so I think democracies, owing, given that, that democracies have tended to be better for li liberty and, and, and rights and, and so on, we have a special responsibility right now to not screw it up, to show that liberalism and democracy have the potential not only to be better on the margins on liberty and rights, but also able to uh, uh, act on behalf of future generations and be patient and uh, uh, to take sustained action rather than flopping back and forth uh, between administrations. Um, because if we don't do that, if democracies don't do that, then it really will give autocracies a comparative advantage moving forward. And uh, that, you know, is going to come up, uh, come with some some costs and harms of its own. So I'll stop there. But but I think that's going to be an increasingly important question that that political theorists need to take really seriously in, in the coming decades. Jeff, yeah, thank you so much. It's always it's always good, actually, when we run right into the end of a, of a of a period it's a good sign of the conversation there are so many questions a lot coming in right towards the end it would be great to get into please do take them up with jeff as he says he'd be very happy to discuss them afterwards 
these are things which you know all of us are working on in different ways and it's and it's been great to have a have a chance to bring some different disciplinary perspectives to uh, to engage around these questions today jeff thank you so much for the book for your time for your thoughts today and thanks to all of our all of our brilliant panelists to beth to john and to raphael and also yolanta for organizing this and the humanities and social sciences faculty here at qm for for making it all happen so hope you enjoyed today's discussion it will be available on the youtube channel shortly and uh, we look forward to welcoming you back to a future event very soon. It's goodbye from us.